Hi, it's Dave again. I'm going to get you to the show in just a moment. We had a great conversation this morning with Drew McManus of Adaptistration. We talked to him about all the crazy things that happened this week in the orchestra world and the New York City Opera and the Minnesota Orchestra, and it was a great conversation. Uh, and right before I send you over there, I again want to just ask a very small favor. I'm not going to keep doing this every week. This is just a temporary thing. If you could please do us, do us the favor of going to podcastawards.com and nominate us for a People's Choice Podcast Award in the cultural slash arts category. We would really appreciate it. Now on to the show. This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And this week, filling in for both Patrick and Nate, he's doing double duty, is our friend Kevin Wilt. If you are a fan of the Sound Notion Network, you've seen Kevin as the co-host of our film music show, Streamers and Punches, which is hot off its successful Emmy bump to Bear McCreary. Uh, who won an Emmy a couple weeks ago for uh, his opening title credits for, uh, what was it? Da Vinci's Demons. Demons. Thank you. So, Kevin, welcome to the show. We're glad you Thank could you. be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, and, of course, because there was so much crazy orchestra stuff that happened this week in, in, the, in the orchestra in orchestra labor world and the orchestra business world, we had to give our friend Drew McManus a call to set us straight. Drew... Uh, writes the Adaptation blog and tells us he, he has forgotten more than any of us will ever learn about how the orchestra business works. Drew, thank you for, for taking some time this morning. I know you're in demand this week. Oh, thanks. It's always a pleasure to be here. So, first of all, if you have not been uh, reading the very depressing news of the week from all around the world, literally all around the world, um, Let's start with the one that we've been talking about the most this this last year or so, uh, the the Minnesota Orchestra. Um, they're they're still not playing any music, and now they are without uh, their their amazing music director Osma Venska. And since that uh, uh, resignation, they are also now without Aaron J. Kernis, who ran their fantastic. Composers Institute, which of course we were all great fans of, um, they're they're out of their their Carnegie shows, and now we are, who knows where we are. So, Drew, what is this? What does this mean for the Minnesota Orchestra? Are they to, is there are they totally cooked? Well, I guess there's two different aspects to apply that to. First is going to be artistic, and then business related. From an artistic standpoint, I think they crossed that threshold a while back, even before Osmo left. There were enough musicians, key musicians especially, uh, in positions that left for other jobs or are on long-term leaves of absence that it was going to have a profound impact on the orchestra artistically. Now that they've lost their music director, there's no doubt. Anyone who is maybe on the fence about that, there simply is no denying that they are no longer the Minnesota Orchestra that they once were. So you've moved into a position where the next big question is where do they go from a business perspective? And barring any sort of ability to have a way for one side to save face in this argument, there's really only two very bad directions they can go. Which are? Well, the first is going to be that the musicians will fold. Uh, they'll accept whatever offer is on the table currently from management, which will almost certainly be a sharply concessionary uh, agreement with both wages, benefits, and work conditions. Or the organization will continue for what I think will be at least another full season of uh, being dark and run out of revenue, at which point the executive leadership, the executive board and the CEO and president, will either leave the organization, a few board members will come in and try to pick up the ashes and put together some kind of uh, agreement with the musicians, or it will fold and go into liquidation bankruptcy. Well, and, and you know, there's a few things that I have read on blogs that are perhaps less reputable than Adaptistration. Um, 
talk about the possibility of the musicians forming their own organization. They have uh, been playing a, a handful of concerts as, as recently as last night as we're recording this, I, I think, was was the kind of the farewell for for Osmo concert. Um, and uh, by by all accounts, it was it was very touching and a very sad moment for for Osmo and for the orchestra and for the of course for the community uh, in in Minnesota. Um, is that a viable thing? It seems to me that there's, that can that can only last so long before you need to start bringing in people that know how to do the things that the Minnesota Orchestra Association was doing, right? True, but there's also some labor law involved here. The musicians can't go out and form a competing organization while they're still employees of the Minnesota Orchestra, even if they're locked out. That has to happen after the organization were to liquidate. And there's actually some precedence in this. It's happened before in Colorado Springs with the former Colorado Springs Symphony Orchestra, which is now the Colorado Springs Philharmonic. The former organization, the Symphony Orchestra, did file liquidation bankruptcy. But at that point in time, the musicians had already uh, put together the groundwork for a new organization with even the former executive director and a number of board members and even the music director. And they launched that simultaneously when the previous organization uh, filed and ended up being able to purchase a large number of the organization's assets in a single purchase from the bankruptcy trustee. So they, they, the Minnesota Orchestra musicians would not be able to do that because they are still employed by the MOA, even though their, their previous collective bargaining agreement has expired? Correct. It is more complex than that, but that's a that's a good simplistic way to look at it. Okay. So that so that's really interesting. Um, I though is there any reason to believe that such an organization, even if they were able to start it, wouldn't eventually just have the same problems that the current organization has? Sure. Uh, there's no reason to think that that's not going to be the case. There's no way to get around the fact that even if they form their own organization and were able to bring in some former board members and current uh, community supporters, that the organization is only going to be up and operating at a fraction of what the current budget is. And they'll have to rebuild an endowment. They'll have to rebuild ticket sales. It's it's not going to be walking in to the same level where they were previously. Yeah. And... uh so w- one of the things that we've talked about all year long with the Minnesota Orchestra, and we, we talk about this a lot when we get into orchestra stories about how it applies to us as composers, and it's sometimes hard to, to make the case that it does uh, with certain orchestras, but that's certainly not the case with the Minnesota Orchestra, who has a, a long history of supporting new music and supporting composers very directly. Um, in the wake of Maestro Vanska's resignation this week, we were really disappointed to see composer Aaron J. Kernis. Well, I, I guess disappointed may not be the right word, but it, we were saddened, of course, to see Aaron J. Kernis resign from his position with the Composers Institute there. Uh, and and uh, Kernis is actually going to be our guest on the show next week. Good. So you should... Uh, anybody that is interested in, in Pulitzer Prize winning composers that also happen to have really interesting news stories happening around them should tune in next week for that. Um, and and in his letter, he kind of accuses all of the parties that are involved in this, in this lockout um, of not really negotiating in good faith and, and, and uh, not take kind of taking these emotional arguments and letting them color the more practical business discussion that that they should be having is that a a, a reasonable criticism that that we can look at both sides of of this uh this lockout as yes, responsible uh, i think it is a a good perspective especially at this point in time if you have this discussions 8 months prior I wouldn't agree to it to that level. But right now, yes, there really is no denying that both sides, musicians, just as much as uh, the uh, executive leadership, are as emotionally entrenched in winning 
and which would be defined only by someone losing. And they want someone to know they lost. Both sides want to force the other into that undesirable position of being viewed from the outside as a loser. Is, is there a way out that could allow both sides to win? Or is that, are we past sure. that? Yeah, there's, there's, there's always a way out of a problem. Uh, and that's the saving face comment I made early on. Is any entrenched labor dispute, even something like this, which has gone beyond the level of anything previously, still can be saved by a way to save face. And the more entrenched both sides become, the more extraordinary that saving face gesture needs to be. But it's always out there. Hmm. So does anyone feel like we're talking about Congress as much as we're talking about the Minnesota Orchestra? You know, it's been it's been yes. all I can do not to make any lockout or any shutdown <laughs> jokes. Sorry. No, that's well, no. We should right. make all it's the shutdown same. jokes we can. Yeah. What were you going to say, Drew? I, I think Kevin's absolutely right. It's the exact same mentality of if we don't get what we want, we'll make sure nothing else works, yeah. even if it means hurting everybody in the long run. And and it's and it's not that each side wants the world. They each want kind of small things, right? And and since and yeah. since no and since they can't have the thing that they want, then they take their ball and go home. Yes. What you're talking about, I think, is perhaps best defined as ideological motivations uh, behind uh, bargaining positions. You can wrap it up in an empirical argument all you want to, but it still always boils down to power and control. Which side gets dominant power over the other via the collective bargaining agreement? Whereas by nature, a healthy collective bargaining agreement has a good bit of checks and balances to allow both stakeholders to be true stakeholders. So... If, if an orchestra gets into a situation like this in the future, how do they keep from getting to the point where Minnesota is? It seems like the, both sides have continued to make the, the exact wrong decisions <laughs> for the last year such that it has got, things have gotten worse and worse. And every time we think this is as bad as it can get, it gets worse in a week, right? Correct. Um, Perhaps the best way to look at that is to always focus on creating an environment for the other side to do the right thing. And that's clearly subjective as to what the right thing is. But if you're always thinking about your public relations campaign, yes, you want to use leverage to try to get the other side to do what you want. But if you're constantly focusing on negative PR talking points and exaggerated spin, that's not really creating an environment for someone to do the right thing if they're taking a truly emotional approach toward negotiations. That's, that's interesting that you you bring up the, the 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 public relations and that that kind of public conversation, which more and more is happening on the web. And we saw this. Um, I don't know if I would say first, but at least came to our attention first uh, with the Detroit symphony uh uh labor dispute a couple of years ago that the members of the community and the musicians got really involved and active on the web and on social media and stuff and and really i think did a a, a good job of driving the conversation in a lot of ways and it took the detroit symphony a long time to figure out that that was happening and how to uh, work with that work in that new space with this new kind of conversation. And it seems to me that the Minnesota Orchestra Association wrapped their 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 hands in <laughs> in some literal ways around that um, that conversation very early on. We talked a few months ago about them snapping up these these domain names that uh, would have been useful to people supporting the musicians um do you see this as a is a is a as a trend or is this something we're going to see in all of these labor disputes going forward is the the community engagement and kind of the uh we get the feeling of of i i made a joke about this regarding something else this week about mommy and daddy fighting and and the audience is like i want to just want to hear the orchestra it, it, 
is, are we going to continue to see these these things play out on the web and the audience get more involved in this conversation? Well, if there's one potential silver lining in this dispute, it really is the clear emergence of the audience stakeholder having uh, a much higher degree of uh, influence and unified, organized voice than it has in the past. Um, the domain name purchase is an interesting aspect because it demonstrates from an institutional point of view that, at least in the Minnesota situation, orchestras as a business have not wrapped their heads around the idea that you have to trust your audience to be able to express the opinion they want without your influence, even if it's not what you want to hear. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry I'm, I'm like, dominating this conversation instead of Sam and Kevin saying anything. I don't know if you no, guys no. have anything you want to add. I'm, I'm know, the color right. man. Um, well, you know, it... I I'm kind of have played the devil's advocate on this topic a lot during the many times that we've discussed it, but um, it br- makes me wonder, are orchestras going to have to just accept um, that they're not going to get paid as much? Because orchestras, um, you know, I, I think that we have to accept something's afoot considering how many orchestras are having problems. Um, now, the cuts that the uh, Minnesota Orchestra was being asked to make were fairly large cuts. Um, I think it was something along the lines of uh, the 40% like 28, range. 28% they were asking them, which, but it should be noted that that would lower their average salary is like something 100 and uh, receive an annual salary. Now, I'm looking at a Huffington Post piece that quotes this, so it may or may not be absolutely correct. <laughs> A hundred and thirty-five thousand average. At least you're not looking at Lebrecht. Right now, um, the, to me, this is a complicated topic because if you want to be a top-tier orchestra, um, it is not just. It's. I don't think it's that one hundred and thirty-five thousand average salary gets you the players you need to sound that good. It's. Well, that's part of it, but it also gives you the prestige that you need to be considered one of the top-tier orchestras because look at how much we pay. Um, are orchestras going to have to start accepting uh, less money or at least not ramping their salaries up as frequently as we've seen like with orchestras um, not being affected by the economic crash like in Los Angeles salaries went up while the economy was crashing? Is this something that's just going to become a fact or is there a way around this and, and are the top tier orchestras going to keep paying this much? There is no universal application. I think that's one of the largest bear traps that people tend to step into with this discussion, is every city, every community is going to have its own unique growth cycle. Um, For example, we were before the program, we were talking about Chattanooga. Chattanooga is a city that's in a large growth cycle right now. Um, There's a lot of good things economically happening in that city. So their variables are going to be different with regard to their collective bargaining agreement and wage and benefit discussions than in a city that's in a very different position. So saying that for an entire field, things have to go in one direction or another denies some very basic economics business 101 uh, aspects where if you put yourself in a position where you believe something is going to happen before you've done an empirical analysis of what your particular situation is, then you're only going to end up in a very bad place. Right. Well, I mean, it's tricky because these these orchestras are, you know, only selling tickets and, and raising money from their local communities, but they're essentially competing for musicians with everywhere in the world. That it's, it's a little bit like uh, small market pro sports teams, right? Um, mm-hmm. This is, I mean, we're 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 talking about Minneapolis, which is not an, an enormous market like Los Angeles is. And and I mean, Drew, I know you're in Chicago, so you you, you may not be familiar with the the baseball postseason that's happening <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> boom. Take that, Chicago. I'm from St. Louis. Um, We always hear about, and everybody always roots for, these smaller market 
pro teams in, in any, not just baseball, but in any sport, I find myself all, like rooting for the, the, you know, the Cleveland Browns or something. Um, and I don't have any particular connection to them, but it's really exciting. Or, you know, th- when, when do we get saber metrics for, for orchestras, <laughs> you know, we we're, we very badly need that. That's one of the things that I've griped about for a decade in this field is the metrics for determining the value of an individual job has been based almost exclusively on how many weeks you play, how many weeks you get off, how much you're paid and what your benefits are. Uh, where workplace satisfaction, artistic satisfaction and job satisfaction aren't elements that are entered into the equation. And surprisingly enough, I've received resistance on both sides of the fence from this. Managers and board members don't want to quantify their workplace satisfaction because they're always afraid it's not going to be good. Musicians that I talk to, especially those involved with any kind of representation role, are leery of it because if the results come back too good, they feel they may not have enough leverage during negotiations, which I don't agree with either point of view. And Minnesota is one of the real tragedies in that it was one of those underdogs you rooted for where, no, they were never going to match the salary of Chicago or Los Angeles. But it had one of the most, uh, at least uh, anecdotally, had one of the most pleasant and satisfying work environments for the musicians, which they did leverage for retention factors. Well, in, and in, I think in all addition, that's now gone. In addition to that, that workplace environment, they were in a, in a, a fantastic orchestra. I mean, I never that's, had that's the opportunity to hear them live, not being anywhere near them. But the, I, the recordings that they were making under Vanska were phenomenal. We listened to a little bit of their Sibelius recording a few weeks ago on the show. It's, it blows my mind that, that the performance could be that is, is good even in a recording. Um, and it's it's really sad to see it go. And if if only, I mean, I I wonder if if they the the MOA understands how artistically valuable the the Minnesota Orchestra is to to the essentially the rest of the world. I don't think they do. Their actions certainly don't dictate that they understand this. And you hit the nail on the head where you know you have a superb gathering of all these variables. The musicians are producing an artistic product that is is greater than the sum of its parts. The music director typically serves as the catalyst to reach that role, even if you're not one of the highest paid orchestras. If you can put all of this together and create a satisfying workplace that produces those kinds of recordings and live experiences, that's something you strive for and should be an institutional goal and you want to preserve at all possible costs as opposed to focusing on some kind of ridiculous business-driven mantra that's going to destroy all of that and then put you into really a prolonged death spiral, even if you get what you want anyway. So uh, you you mentioned the role of the music director here. And I read some criticism this week of Vanska saying that he did not do enough to work to end the lockout. And they specifically, one one of these articles specifically cited uh, Slatkin in Detroit working to end that, uh, that, that that was a strike, I believe. Um, And, I, I, do you think that that's a, a reasonable criticism? It seems to me that in general, music directors are best served to s- stay out of this kind of thing. Um, but do you think Vanska could have done more or should have done more? Uh, well, I'm I, I'm not in a position to have enough information to say. Okay. I think that's certainly one of the cases. A lot of people who say maybe something should or shouldn't probably doesn't have all the information either. I do think that music director's role is very difficult during these situations. And the more involved they get, the easier it is for them to get sucked into, inadvertently or not, supporting one side more than the other in some sort of leverage attempt. 
Yeah, and, and I think one thing that we talked about with the Detroit Symphony was that the music director's work really begins after the the sides come together and they have to like make concerts happen again <laughs> and and make right. make everybody work together again because they're really kind of the go they they are in charge and in in some ways part of the management side but at the same time they are also talent and musicians themselves and uh there aren't a whole lot of members of the organization maybe they're the only one that really serves both of those functions uh, uh, there is, I would put a, a much clearer line there because yes, even though the music director is the artistic talent side of the equation, they still serve in a senior executive position. Yeah. And when it comes down to it, the musicians are the employees, the music director is the boss. Yeah. And you can, you can equate it to any typical office environment. Your employees do not have a 100% unfiltered line of communication to the boss doesn't happen well so um we should maybe move on to another so this was just one one bit of bad <laughs> orchestra business news that we we've been talking about it don't was look down yeah don't yeah don't look down don't don't uh you know start drinking anything if you haven't read the news this week because i would hate for you to have a spit take on your computer <laughs> um the City Opera, New York City Opera, which we've been talking about for, for a long time, because not just because they have business problems, but also because they have been doing some really interesting work with new operas uh, over the last few years, notably the U.S. premiere of Mark Anthony Turnage's Anna Nicole Opera, which now looks like it's going to be the last thing they ever do. Um, they, they filed uh, for Chapter 11 this week. Um, and uh, the uh, the quote in the in the New York Times uh, this week was included a quote from the opera itself uh, from Anna Nicole's death scene. Quote: Made some bad choices, then made some worse choices, then ran out of choices. Unquote. <laughs> that is from the death scene of the title character of the last opera the New York City Opera will likely ever produce. <laughs> I don't think it gets any more perfect than that. Um, it's really sad because New York City should be one of the great cultural capitals of the world, and, and it is. But the great cultural capitals of the world should be able to support more than one big opera company. And this is an opera company. This is not like a fly-by-night, you know, funky, quirky little upstart chamber opera kind of thing. Like, if there are a bunch of those, and they're very exciting, and they're not just in New York, but they're all over. And if, but, but if one of those folded that's been around for five years, I would be sad, but I wouldn't be surprised. When City Opera, which is an institution that has a history going back to, uh, I think it, one of the founding board members was Fiero LaGuardia. Um, this is a, an opera company that's been around for like 70 years or something. What does it say when, uh, and, and this, this can be for anybody, what does it say when that kind of institution has to fold? Anybody? Is it in dominate the conversation? Say what? Well, you're the expert, Drew. Is I'm not <laughs> curious. Is it is it institutional, um, or yeah. is is could they? In or other words, systemic? could they have? Is there like is there no way they can do? Is this just not possible? Yeah, could they have saved themselves if they had made some different choices as as few as say two years ago? Uh, no, by that point in time, I think the organization <laughs> was done for. Uh, it was pretty much a zombie organization after Steel took over. Well, they gutted um, their love, endowment, right? I'm I'm sorry. Didn't they? They gutted their endowment a few years ago, right? Right. right. Been downhill uh, since then. It, it, right, and at that point in time, they really would have been in a better position to just liquidate, as opposed to going through the very public, very angry labor dispute that brought about that letter with all the. The, the past artists, the big names that said that this was a bad decision. And all it did was help reinstate and solidify fear in the minds of other organizations, which is why I think it's it was a zombie group. It just kind of wandered around biting other boards and institutions and spreading that 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 unhealthy, ultimately fatal approach. They should have known it was done. They should have signed out. 
So the discussion really should pick up from that point right before Steele arrived to what could and should have happened with the organization. And this brings up, I think, one of the real tragedies of this business is because of the collegial nature, especially among boards and, and management, is nobody ever takes a step back and does a, a good public postmortem of an organization that went out of business. And and it's it's interesting. A, a lot of times, these these kinds of problems are just related to them not bringing in enough money. We've seen labor disputes that are that are not really related to money at all. And we saw one at Carnegie this week that wasn't related to to money at all. Um, but then there are things like the New York City Opera, which is pretty seems for, from my perspective anyway to pretty much only be about not having enough money to to continue on and they were selling tickets they were they were sold at something like 95 percent capacity for anna nicole which is for a an opera of any kind much less one that was written three years ago is pretty crazy um well dave see that brings up something that i've been thinking about a lot it's sure they sold out but you know this is not a for-profit institution, really, you know. Um, selling tickets is not going to save them. There are other revenue streams that they have to harness in order to keep going. And uh, it's not surprising to me that they've been having trouble making that work. Um, Greg Sandow has a what I thought was a pretty interesting piece uh, published October 2nd on his He's blog. He's been on fire lately. <laughs> yeah, and his basic thesis of this one is the classical music – um, broadly speaking, is suffering because the audience is aging, and he quotes some specifics in there. Um, as 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 recently as 1980, well, compare he compares in 1982 the NEA did a, a comprehensive study, and uh, compared to 1955, in 1955 half of the classical music audience concert goers were under 35. Um, in 1982, that was cut in half. In 1982, and now there's not a comprehensive study he could comment on from the very present time. But <laughs> anecdotally, I think we can all say, look around at audiences and say that that has gone down even more. Um, and and more specifically, he talks about classical music is just not in the center of the cultural discussion anymore by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, record companies hardly ever exclusively distribute classical music. They have expanded to include world music and other things, basically for financial reasons. And the media doesn't cover it. He was talking about when he started as a classical music critic, um, I forgot the magazine, uh, for Vanity Fair or something like that. But anyway... About two thirds of the stories um, in that magazine at that time were about classical music. Ten years later, that had dropped to about one third, and two thirds of it was popular music. And now it's got to be even far less than that. Um, and to me, this is a worthwhile conversation. And he makes the analogy of uh, another thing that has dropped in popularity that people don't have a lot of invo emotional investment in, so it's easier to talk about it without letting your emotions dictate what you think about it. He compares it to model train building. Model train building has seen a huge decline, and the average, popula the average age of the population who is still engaged with it has increased dramatically because trains just aren't the center of our, our culture anymore, and the same is true of classical music. Um, so... It's it's not. But the as difference is like nobody's going to mourn the loss. Maybe they will. Maybe I'm just a callous jerk. But nobody's going to mourn the loss of the model train. Right. Hobbyists. But see, that's the point. Mourning the loss, it, more, the, knowing that it's something people are going to mourn the loss of, clouds your judgment about talking about what's really going on. And his thesis is that, duh, you know, it's not important to the population. And because if you're going to talk about something that's important culturally in a way that makes it financially viable, it's got to be culturally important to the money spenders, the people who are out there driving the economy. And the geriatric set is not the people who are driving the economy. Um, so to me, that's, that's like an overall problem that's happening with classical music that I don't know how to solve. Um, Drew, what do you have to say to that? 
Uh, a couple of things. First of all, the graying of the audience argument is a good discussion to have. It's not as much of a profound impact on the business as Mr. Sandow makes. Uh, there are difficulties with the numbers, there's difficulties with the analysis, there's a good bit of incomplete information. The more time you spend on that is time you're taking away and resources you're diverting from efforts that you need to be involved with. Let's take the, the model train industry. Um, I'll, I'll one-up your model tra uh, train industry with woodworking, which back in the late 80s, woodworking was on a large decline with uh, uh, as far as its popularity among uh, individuals that at least kept the that little field uh, going, folks in the su folks in the suburbs that were building things on their own. Tool development hadn't really gone very far, and it was geared toward one sex only men. Fast forward to the late '90s, and then through the first decade of the 2000s, and there were very specific woodworking manufacturers and retailers that determined this isn't going to work and if we don't if we don't change what we're doing we're not going to be able to be in business any longer but they never once sat back and said well we're not selling anything because the people who use our products are getting old and they don't want to use it anymore and they never lost faith that what they were offering had value because it was in and of itself an art form what they did was they began to realize that we have to expand in to the women demographic. They look right down to the very basics of tool design. Tools were made for, for, for individuals with larger hands. They started to resize the tools, they changed their marketing to include more women. Go to a woodworking show in your area now. They're a huge business that's done even better through the recession because people are even more interested in doing as much as they can on a lower cost. There are far more tools available. There's far better instruction material. It's much easier for people to find a path into the business, but the tools themselves have not changed in price. They're as expensive as they ever were, if anything, even more, because there's more specialty tools out there. And that's a business that turned itself around and is now in a very good place and didn't take that same defeatist attitude of, well, we're not relevant because we're not worthy of being relevant. Well, I don't, I don't think Greg Sandow is throwing his hands in the air and saying nothing can be done. I think he's just pointing out this is a big aspect of the problem, and I think that's a great analogy, Drew. However, I went to a concert the other night, and Brahms Academic, uh, Fe Academic Festival Overture and Tragic Overture were both on the concert. You know, this is not the kind of thing that's going to reach out and grab any kind of different audience. You know, they're not, it seems like orchestras aren't doing the work to resize the tool to fit the hand of a different audience. That's they're, a better discussion to have. And from your point, who then is responsible within that organization, which I guess we don't have the name, that you went to listen to the concert, who was responsible for the programming? Well, you'd have to assume the, the music director, but those decisions being driven directly by who's donating money to the orchestra. And who's donating money to the orchestra? Probably old people. The golden rule. Yeah, there's no denying that. But it's more like the silver rule in this case. That are not entrenched and in fixed fortifications, if you think about it from that point of view. Every mind can be changed. Every discussion can can have a different outcome than what it had previously if you if you go about doing it a different way. Doing the analysis of trying to figure out what needs to change is a relevant part of that. But I do think a good bit of the discussions going on have a very defeatist, almost apologetic perspective to it. And if that's the direction you want to have, good luck with that. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that I think comes up sometimes in these discussions is th there's this weird like self righteousness that these organizations have. Like we are <laughs> we are intrinsically worthy of existing because we just we're are. Art. Say what? We're the greatest art. Exactly. Great. Yeah, I know. It's just as it's just as much of a bullshit point of view. Uh, it's as, just as bad as being defeatist. Yeah, and it, it, I don't understand where where it comes. Like, if you're not offering value, then you don't get to keep happening. So you need to figure out how to offer value to people, and it, your value is not intrinsic. Like, it's not 
like we're good because we are an orchestra. This city is cultured because they have an orchestra. It's about the things that the orchestra does and the things that the city opera does. Um, and it it, 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 it it drives me crazy. And I, I read a lot about the future of journalism as well. And they have this, newspapers have the same problem. Like we are... We are journalism with a capital J. We are culture with a capital C in 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 classical music, and there's not like that it, name is not valuable to me. It, it it's the thing that you make or the thing that you do that is valuable to me. Um and and I don't know I don't know how we we move on from that except well I don't know how do we move on from that? You have to take a capitalist point of view. Uh, toward it. You have to continuously justify your existence. And at one point in time, that elitist, we are, we are great art, so that's what makes us good. At one point in time, that was a valuable perspective to have. What happened was that never evolved. And things need to evolve to be able to, to remain relevant. And it became entrenched. And the negatives that come out of that started to unfold. The well, fact that that's not intrinsic, I think, is important because it means you can change, but you're going to have to really work at it because now you got to catch up, and you're never going to catch up by going slower. Well, it seems to me that 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 in, that intrinsic value, that intrinsic societal value argument, is kind of the the philosophical basis for for public support of the arts, right? For 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 the government funding the arts, and we've seen a lot of obviously the the government isn't funding much of anything. <laughs> In the United States right now, but orchestras around the world are, are running into these problems as well. There, there was a, 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 some kind of action in Spain a couple of weeks ago. A bunch of orchestras getting together to to protest uh, Spanish government funding uh, of the arts going down. And we just saw this week on Monday in Germany, the Berlin Philharmonic led a one day strike of. Every orchestra in Germany, every professional orchestra in Germany, in protest of budget cuts to orchestras and, and arts organizations in Germany. Germany has gone in the last 20 years, according to uh, this, uh, this statement from the, the Berlin Philharmonic, uh, we've, we've gone from 168 orchestras to only 131 orchestras, which still sounds like a lot of professional orchestras to me, but <laughs> Germany is, is a pretty populous country. There's something like 80 million people that live in Germany, and so that's like not totally out of line with what we have in the United States. Um, the League of American Orchestras has us somewhere between 350 and 400 professional orchestras for the 300 or so million Americans, um, but it's still, it's still a big change. Um, and I, we, we still see orchestras relying on this, this nonprofit model that rely, they rely on, uh, charitable giving, they rely on government funding. And is there a way for an orchestra to exist? You talk about a capitalist model. Is, is there a way in a, in a purely for-profit capitalist sense for, orchestras and opera companies to exist? Well, first of all, let's define capitalism in that context. If you're thinking about a for-profit orchestra that runs entirely on earned income, good luck with that. Let me know how it works out for you. <laughs> gonna... But intrinsic value is, is not something that is uh, a single definition. You know, I'm sitting here while we're talking, and I'm, I'm looking at two, two monitors on my screen, an iPad and a Samsung Galaxy S4. Apple has done a hell of a job with making people believe that having their iPhone or their iPad is an intrinsic part of their lives. My wife and I had the discussion just this morning on the way to the airport that the government shutdown would have been over after the first day if it included shutting down Facebook. <laughs> the social media have intrinsic value on society. That's a great discussion to have. And classical music's no different. You have to sell yourself to your audience, to your community, to become intrinsic. Being intrinsic is a goal of being in business from a very capitalistic point of view. It makes your job of selling that much easier. Can, can an orchestra ever be as as entrenched in like the day-to-day -day 
understanding of what a city is as Facebook is, though? I'm not... Oh, no, see, never to that level. But, I mean, that's... You know, not all products are going to reach that level. You know, if, if an orchestra could increase itself to have that level of intrinsic value to 10% of any given community, that would be insane, bonkers level of value-oriented offerings. Right now, the average, I think, with the night study done, God knows how many years ago at this point, uh, of the average participation among a community is between 3 and 5%. So if you can get that to 10%, which doesn't really seem all that large, you're going to have a huge amount of not just earned, but unearned and corporate sponsorship because of all the dynamic benefits that come with it. People are going to want to buy more advertising for your program book and want to support your concerts and sponsor them because there's more eyeballs looking at that sponsorship than before. That's intrinsic value to the individual sponsor, whether they think your art form is worth providing or not. Are there any orchestras that are succeeding at doing that in the United States that are that are really kind of becoming or or that are part of the 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 bedrock of the community in that sense? Yeah, I think LA's done a fantastic job with it. Nashville, uh, even with their recent financial troubles, they pulled out of that problem by demonstrating the value of intrinsic benefit they have for their community by being able to get the support they needed, even if it was at the 11th hour and 59th minute. They <laughs> still were able to pull it out and push back against some of the bank problems that they had by taking more of a populist approach than is perhaps typically assigned to an American classical music orchestra. Well, and w so what are they doing that's so different, and, and why aren't why aren't other orchestras doing those th similar things? Oh, why do we have four more hours? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, yeah. I suppose that's kind of my question I I as well. Is you know, Drew, you mentioned the, the idea of the woodworking industry sort of having to adapt. It's not that there haven't been any orchestras that that nobody's figured this out. It's there clearly <laughs> some organizations that kind of do have this figured out. I think L.A. is a good example. I think San Francisco, although they just had uh, a recent labor issue, they, I think they're, they kind of have it figured out a little bit too. Why, why is it so difficult for other organizations to look at what these groups are doing and sort of adapt that for themselves? Boy, that should be the question that frames the next League of American Orchestras conference right there. Well, they're 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 uh, welcome to you know fly me in for the conference. It's fine. <laughs> Kevin's Kev, they're, it. Kevin's going to have a, a whole panel where he just asks questions of people, and they say, right. "Hmm, that's a good question," <laughs> and then they'll so, give you an answer to something you didn't ask. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I've got a what to me is a pretty interesting question that just occurred to me, uh, and I was thinking about the Sandow piece and how little media covers orchestras um, or classical music. But that's actually not been true lately because classical music in the form of labor disputes has been getting lots of media coverage. But in Bloomberg Business Week, not in the New York Times right. arts <laughs> section. Right, but, but I still think... that about having it covered in Bloomberg? Why don't you want the business of orchestras covered in Bloomberg as much as the artistic review in the New York Times? That's a good point. Well, then that raises the, the kind of dovetails into my thought is... Um, people are going to become a little more educated about the business side of orchestras. I mean, I think if you ask the average person who may has been to like one orchestra concert in their entire life, they might think that orchestras operate by selling tickets and they make money from selling tickets and that's how they work. Um, but people are becoming, are going to, it just seems like they're going to have to become more educated about how that financial system works and how much orchestra musicians get paid and this kind of thing. And there was a, you know, a piece that a lot of people snide, uh, made snide remarks about a couple of weeks ago in The Telegraph, basically the, making, positing that, you know, rich people are going to have to decide to donate money to something. And if you donate money to an orchestra, you get this. And it, he was not talking about equivalency, and I got had Twitter arguments with people about this. The argument was, rich dude donating money somewhere, if he donates it to an orchestra, what does he get? And if he donates it to somebody who's trying to cure you know, some sort of a disease in, in third world countries, what does he get for that? Um, 
so you know people are gonna the, a new generation of rich people are is going to be coming into place after the baby boomers start going away and they're gonna make decisions about where to give their money and they're gonna have some information about how orchestras operate based on all the labor disputes that we're seeing covered in the media these days um and like I was playing the devil's advocate against some people in this these Twitter arguments. Uh, making the point like, okay, someone in the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the average uh, pay is $140,000 a year. Now, that's understanding that the cost of living there is very high and their benefits package might not be the same as you'd have in other organizations. But basically, you're talking about a nonprofit organization that relies on charity to keep working. And you compare that to an actual what we consider a, an according to Hoyle nonprofit where somebody who's a caseworker helping underprivileged families or something like that, and I was doing some research about that this morning, that type of person, broadly defined, there's lots of different types of person, but that person makes on average countrywide about $70,000 a year. So you can play Scheherazade on two rehearsals, and that's worth $140,000 a year, and you help single mothers with substance abuse problems overcome that and have a stable home environment for their kids, and we as a culture think that's worth $70,000. Um, to me, that's a pretty valid argument, and, and, and I can see how people going forward, the people who are going to be making these organizations keep stay afloat are, are going to – know these things too, at least more than they have in the past. Yeah, I think that's actually one of the best uh, potential outcomes of the season of discontent or orchestra apocalypse 2013, 12, 14, 15, however long it's going to last. And, uh, well, I'll, 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 I'll give you guys kind of a scoop in the special here is Ooh. at the end of this month, maybe beginning of November, I am going to launch a Kickstarter campaign to raise enough money to begin to take all the professional orchestra 990s for the past 10 years to make them keyword searchable and to make that a free service for anyone who wants to come in and be able to start to look through uh. orchestra 990s and begin to have a better understanding of how their organization functions from a business perspective. And for, for people is, that don't know what that means, can you maybe just give a, a, a brief explanation of what those 990s are? Sure. Your IRS Form 990 is what uh, orchestras file to the Internal Revenue Service, that is their tax return. It lists their income, their expense, uh, everything from the uh, uh, compensation and benefits for employees that earn over $100,000 to uh, their highest paid contractors, where their funds come from, if they have any outstanding debt, a large amount of transparency. So you're gonna you're gonna make these these records searchable for the benefit of everyone else, so that we can learn. Uh, well, so maybe I, maybe I'm just not understanding what what information are you hoping to glean from these these forms that we that is opaque now. Well, the problem with the process right now is even though IRS 990s are open to everyone free of charge, they're difficult to get through. I mean, just not having a document that's keyword searchable. If you don't know where to look through a 78 page document for, if you want to know what the executive director is paid. For the organization, you want to know what the CEO is paid. You want to know how much they spent on advertising for the year. It's a lot of work. All of that can get cut down with a keyword searchable database, which can be filtered by state, by organization. You can pick different groups and do multiple key searches at the same time. So you can begin to do your own analysis and better understand exactly how that particular organization or organizations you're interested in function so that you can become or you at least have a way to manifest your degree of interest in being a vested participant and a stakeholder with the organization it's giving them it's giving a valuable metric to the public that will help and i think this is a good thing in the long run even if it hurts some organizations cultural accountability to the institution in question you know um you, so you don't have to have you know have a podcast that you can convince Drew McManus to come on 
in order to get this kind of information. You can find it yourself. I actually saw that um, survey on your blog, Drew, and and um, I, like most people, said yes. I think this is fantastic, but no, I don't want to pay anything for it. So, <laughs> so would this would this solve some of the problems that we saw uh, regarding the the Minnesota dispute, where there there was there were discrepancies about the the financial data that the Minnesota Orchestra was releasing and the the musicians said like those, those it's not <coughs> entirely accurate and they were just back and forth about the accuracy of the the budgets that were released well the 990s are never going to solve that degree of detail of discussion but okay. what it's going to do is give people enough data that they can begin to look at the spin that can come from either side during a dispute and start to ask their own questions Maybe there's information that's not there. They want this information to be explained. There's going to be a higher degree of demand for accountability and transparency in a field that historically is very Nixon-esque. Well, and it lets us, I, I suppose, also lets us compare the the numbers from these more dysfunctional ensembles, these more dysfunctional organizations, with some of those particularly successful organizations that you mentioned earlier, like Los Angeles and Nashville. And we can say, look, these guys are doing something different than what's going on here. How can we get from, from where we are to somewhere closer to that? Um, and so in, in, that, in that way, I think that the, the big data comparative sense is, is good, could be really helpful. And we're also hoping deep down that it will inspire a greater deal of detail-oriented explanation in some of the uh, appendices of what usually come along with a 990. For example, I did a recent analysis for a reporter in Atlanta that was investigating uh, one of their local performing arts organizations, and he just asked me to take a look at the 990, and I went through the areas that I normally do, and one of the immediate things that popped up of interest was this $1 million loan given to one of the senior officers. But the loan isn't explained anywhere mm. in the document, and that's typically something that accompanies a loan, especially of that size, which is highly unusual. If the public were to look into something like this, and organizations know that there is a regular stream of public examination, it's, it's going to change how they do business. And I'm a firm believer in increased transparency is only going to improve that overall process. So now some of these questionable decisions are currently kind of in the in the security through obscurity wall where mm -hmm. we just we just like nobody's looking so it's basically a secret but only because people aren't looking um and now people will be easily able to find this information and then they can see hey what's what's going on with this thing here Right? Well, precisely. And the rise, and what I'm hoping isn't just a, a temporary occurrence, but the true permanent rise of the audience stakeholder, the organized audience stakeholder group, are going to be the people who are likely going to be the first line of interest in something like this, because they're the ones who are going to look at it. They're not board members. They don't have the responsibility board members do, but yet the board is still accountable to... Uh, to, to not just monitor, but also take care of the public trust and the public interest. And the best way the public can do to help that process is to be as involved as possible and ask questions. And if they look at everything and they think things are r running wonderfully, then that's just even more of a reason to be proud of an organization that you have in your area. Well, Drew, I, I think you have explanation skills Second, possibly only to Bill Clinton. Yeah, you should write so, a blog or something about this. <laughs> so, I really hope, like, you gotta, you, like, making this thing sexy enough for people to want to donate it to a Kickstarter is going to be hard. But if anybody can do it, I have faith in you. So, so <laughs> please get people, you know, I, I know you're going to make some kind of super snappy video or something to sell this idea. And, and I'm going to shamelessly plug it on the show because, to me, this is a very important thing, and I really hope it happens. I will shamelessly thank you for plugging it as much as you possibly can. <laughs> we, we should mention that there is actually good news in, in the world of classical music, um, and it actually is related to someone 
who is also a great explainer, a uh, friend of the show, Alex Ross, as we all know, is good at explaining to the population at large um, what to listen for in music and why 20th century music is something that they should enjoy and placing it in historical context and artistic context. Um, the second part of the South Bank Center's year-long celebration of 20th century music the Rest is Noise Festival, named after the book by uh, Alex Ross, is uh, kicking off, and it is doing extremely, extremely well. Yeah, um, they uh, they kind of took a summer break, and now they're back. They just last week started back, and uh, Jessica Duchenne, who we've talked about on the show before, a, a really interesting classical music blog, you should all follow Jessica Duchenne, um, she posted some numbers that uh, the South Bank Center, who's hosting this festival, had posted about it, and she had all kinds of really interesting numbers. Uh, we should say that that Bob Shingleton has gone back and and maybe uh, given us some reason to be a little skeptical of these these ticket numbers from uh, the Tessitura system that that they use, uh, which is kind of the the industry standard for for ticketing now, right, Drew? Um, no comment. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's it's certainly widely used. Yes. Okay, is. we'll go with that. Um, and uh, it, it, among other things, gives data about the the people that are that are coming in to buy tickets. Um, it's kind of ticketing and audience tracking and and uh, some some related functions. Uh, um, alleged claims. Say what? There are alleged claims on those. Sure. <laughs> Well, I, I won't get too much more into uh, what Test Tour is or does, but uh, the Rest is Noise Festival organizers say that three-quarters of their ticket buyers had not bought tickets for a contemporary classical event at South Bank before. Uh, 45% of them had never been to any classical concert there before, and about a third of them had never been to South Bank Center before, uh, where where the festival is being hosted. Um, and they say they, they sold about... Now, this is a little bit misleading. Uh, three times as many tickets for contemporary classical music during the festival than in 2012. I assume they're just doing more contemporary classical music with the <laughs> festival than they did in 2012. Probably at least three times more. Um, and uh, it's it's certainly changing the, uh, the way that at least uh, Jessica Duchenne is thinking about... Uh, contemporary classical music. Now, we should say, when she is writing about contemporary classical music, she's talking about everything in The Rest is Noise, which starts all the way back at, at like, Elgar. Right. <laughs> um, so, which, hey, is a step in the right direction, at least. Or, or, or Richard Strauss, I guess, is, is where that one begins. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, not, not the most contemporary of contemporaries. But now, with it goes chronologically, the more or less, and the festival is kind of following the, the the path of the book, and they're now getting into the the parts where there are not dead people uh, whose music is being performed, and some of those people are actually even coming to the concerts and talking. Um, so that's really nice. But one of the things that I thought was interesting that she points out was that it, her experience going to the concerts, they uh, the the atmosphere around them is feels modern and feels fun and interesting and is pulling in the kinds of you know young arts interested people i don't have a good word for i'm sure drew that there is a an appropriate like culturally engaged cu culturally engaged young people word uh that that you use to describe this demographic but she, she describes it as feeling more like a fringe festival than a a a chamber music festival or an orchestra music festival or something like that did they burn a large straw conductor at the end right <laughs> they burned a large straw conductor they all sat in the mud and uh you know they all they all uh ate mushrooms i think at one point <laughs> yeah um, and no matter no matter how the numbers might be skewed um Certainly, it's drawing some new people in, and even if the new people, they're overestimating the new people, they're selling out the concerts, which is a good thing, no matter who's showing up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And in the end, that's who your audience is now. It may not be who you thought it was or who you thought you wanted, but whoever's buying tickets is who you want to be there. Sure. Right. 
So, congratulations to them. I don't know if there's anything else we have to add. Anybody? I, I, another congratulations, by the way, to the I Care If You Listen blog. Uh, Thomas Neville has been on the show before, uh, announced this week that, that they won uh, an ASCAP Foundation Deems Taylor Media Award for their coverage of contemporary music and composers. So congratulations to, to Thomas and I Care If You Listen. Um, I assume that now that we know that web shows like House of Cards can win Emmys, that it's really only a matter of time uh, for Sound Notion. <laughs> That's right. Right? Um, so, you know, as, as Stephen Colbert would gesture. <laughs> <laughs> gimme. Though I guess he has an Emmy now, so he doesn't need to do the gimme, any, gimme gesture anymore. He won, he won his, his Emmy last week or a couple weeks ago. Um, but that's very exciting. Speaking of, of, of awards, if, if you're listening to this show now, if you are listening to the sound of my voice, if you could please go to podcastawards.com and nominate Sound Notion in the cultural slash arts category for a People's Choice Podcast Award, we would appreciate that. We've not won any. Is a link up to that on the show summary? Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have a link to that in our show notes, um, podcastawards.com and we're we're in the uh i there are a couple of categories that we might reasonably be associated with i think we're going to shoot for cultural slash arts this time but uh we'll see how it goes we haven't won any awards and we haven't tried to do this thing before but we 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 usually don't ask very much uh there's not really a call to action at the end of a sound notion episode most of the time. Well, this is deserving. I mean, I'm not trying to blow sunshine up your back end, but you guys really are doing something that is moving the entire cultural discussion forward. I started blogging in 2003, and I could count on one hand the number of cultural bloggers that existed. And back then, it was fringe and new and different and unusual. And now it's very much old man screaming at children to get off his lawn compared to what you guys are doing. <laughs> so, you know, I've, I've, I've loved watching the evolution of the show and how the production values and the ease at which you're able to move in and out of topics. And to me, being able to move out of the shoehorned box of only talking about new music and how it relates in the larger cultural field is just whether you realize it or not has moved this entire business forward light years. Well, that, thank you very much. That means a lot, Drew. We like you too. <laughs> we, if, if it were not for your blog, we would know pretty much nothing about how orchestras work. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so any any time there's anything that goes on in regarding orchestras, my my first site that I visit to figure out what is happening is 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 adaptation. So Adapt adaptation jobs is actually a point of consternation for me because I'll see jobs flash by, and you know my wife now has a good job, so here I am in Alabama, and I'll see that job, and I'm like, oh, I would like to move to Hawaii to work at that place or whatever. But anyway, people who don't know about that, Adaptistration Jobs, if you're an art person of some kind, it's a great place to look. Yeah, Drew, yeah, why don't you go ahead nice and, and, and plug all your stuff? I'm sorry? Why don't you go ahead and plug all your stuff? I thought of making a, oh. uh, a lower third for you with all of your <laughs> URLs that would like gradually take up the entire screen of all of your, your <laughs> excellent projects. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's, gross, let's wrap up and you, you go ahead and plug away. Well, sure. There's the blog at adaptistration.com, which is about the orchestra business. There's adaptistration.com forward slash jobs, which is a free marketplace to have organizations post openings and free for job seekers to search for orchestra administration jobs. Uh, there's also Adaptistration Premium, which is in the process of evolving because of this Kickstarter project that's coming along. There's uh, my business, which is orchestraconsulting.com for arts consulting. And then there's Venture Industries Online, which is the performing arts and artist focused website development hosted management solution. That's just selling like gangbusters, actually. I couldn't be happier. Well, and you know, we talk about uh, uh, music nerdy things all the time and music geeky things, but the a lot of the things that you write on your blog about about these these this venture platform stuff is tech geeky in a way that I really enjoy, and the sites that people are making that you that you link to on venture platform look 
gorgeous and it's it's super exciting to see these kind of seemingly frumpy cultural institutions really embracing these really exciting new web technologies um so the the stuff you're doing with 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 all with venture and and inside the arts and all these all these new these new web things is is wonderful to see um so thank you so much for your time we we really love talking to you um and and it's even though every time we talk to you it seems like we're talking about these the world kind of the, the walls crumbling around us in in our industry uh we 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 certainly in, enjoy hearing your perspective so thank you very much thanks for having me and there's always a silver lining somewhere <laughs> it's good to remember thank you for for leaving us with that uh if you'd like to find links to any of the stories that we what we talked about this week you can find those on our site soundnotion.tv slash sn you can also leave us a comment there if you'd like to interact with us we'd love for this conversation to continue with you uh and you can do that on facebook on twitter on youtube you can like us you can follow us you can subscribe to us you can comment in any of those places and we certainly read those if you have a story that you think that would be great for us to discuss on the show you can tweet us at hashtag sn weekly and we always look at that when we're putting together the show each week uh you can subscribe to us in itunes we have a new show that's launching soon about electronic music that you can find in the iTunes store now. You can find on our site called Patch In. Uh, subscribe to that and all our shows uh, in the iTunes store. Uh, you can support us with our Amazon affiliate search box thing. But really, the the my my real call to action this week is the is the podcast award thing that I mentioned earlier. So we appreciate everyone who has already done that. If you've not done that, you have I think another week or so uh, to do that. Um, it's open for the first two weeks of October, and uh, we'll we'll let you know how that goes. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thank you again so much for watching or listening, and we will see you back next week with Pulitzer Prize winner Aaron J. Kernis.